Uh, happy to be here in Hartford. I'm uh, going to talk to you about something that's hopefully near and dear to your hearts, end-of-life planning, because everything has to die eventually, including software. So we're going to talk about insurance for your software products. Uh, I'm going to change up my planned agenda a little bit because uh, the, the Q&A thing we're not really doing, so I'll put this up as a, as a topic later for open spaces. If people want to talk about it more, we can talk about it in an open space. Uh, so you all get bonus content, so there you go. I'd like to start talking about the software life cycle. Everyone has seen one of these, I'm sure. Uh, one of the speakers yesterday had something very similar to it. Uh, your general cycle through all these things, but this is the type of life cycle that uh, I want to refer to when I'm talking about software life cycle here, where you go through when your concept or your product comes out and then you prototype it, you come up with a minimum viable product, uh, you do some, some AB releasing, and now it's live to the to the public as of that point. There's still a feature growth phase where you're still in kind of traditional development where your groups of developers will go through and continue to, to, to make it better. So anything at that point, I still consider traditional de development. At the point that feature growth stops, we're now in the phase that I consider sustaining engineering. You're still gonna have a life cycle for that product where you're no longer putting out new, new features uh, into it, but you still need to support it and eventually you're probably gonna deprecate it and retire it, but the timeline for that is who knows, and your dev team at that point is basically finished with the product and done and moved on to other things, hopefully. So there are some problems here uh, that uh, if they aren't inherent in your minds already, I'd like to, to point out, uh, and the solution I, I'm gonna propose, uh, spoiler, it's called sustaining engineering, uh, but there are a couple different stories here that uh, um, might sound similar to you. So you've got two people who build the bulk of a service, then they leave for different companies, and their squad mates are left with this service. What, what happens to the, to the code there? Who sustains it? Who owns it? How does it move forward? Uh, you've got two other people who build the thing, and they go to different squads within the same company uh, because shifting priorities, teams reform, etc. There was also someone on the previous squad, but that person was on leave, so who gets that service? It, it depends. Like, if something goes wrong with it, who, who gets called? Like, this, this is not, there's no one right answer uh, for this. This is a problem that a lot of people run into. Uh, or my friends, the Butterbeer Squad, have got four separate products, great products. People have cycled in and out. There's only one person left who knows about the two legacy products, and she gets a really sweet deal from, from Amazon. So now what's the company going to do? Are they going to say, well, we're gonna pay a ton because this person is the only one who knows anything about how to build and deploy these two things that, that we need. So probably uh, there's some problems there. So let's talk about what sustaining, sustaining engineering could look like, how you could solve these problems. I'd like to start off by saying that uh, some people talk about DevOps as a team or a, uh, a type of person, but I, I prefer to think of DevOps as, as a methodology. It's a way that we work. So the stuff that I'm talking about is not, uh, it's not something that is separate from DevOps. Sustaining engineers also practice DevOps. The people doing traditional development also practice DevOps. But at some point, you're going to run into these problems simply because your staffing changes. And staffing changes all the time across every, every project and every product. So, when a service needs to exist unchanged for the foreseeable future, there's, there's going to need to be sustaining engineering. Whether that's done by the traditional development team that has built it and they're going to continue to own it, or it's going to be done by a separate class of people, that, that's work that needs to be done. So the transfer of that work from one group to, to another who is designed in a way to handle these sustaining capabilities uh, over the long term is advantageous for, for a company to think about. So I'd like to talk about a sustaining engineering team. Uh, I'm going to introduce a little bit of different terminology. I'm going to refer to the team as the Purple Cross team or Team Purple Cross, so that when I say sustaining engineering, I'll be talking about kind of the, the practice and not about the team. Your sustaining engineering team, being the people, are going to be the Purple Cross team. So what the Purple Cross team looks like, they're a persistent team of engineers that have a catalog of supported services, um, kind of like 
you know, a traditional IT, here, here are the things that, that we provide, except those services are, are generally software products that were usually written by, by someone else. So a little bit of humility here. I don't have this all figured out yet. I'm only about halfway through the, the process on uh, getting everything nailed down. So this is very much a conversation starter. Uh, I have some ideas for what has worked for us, but I also have some slides at the end where I don't have the answers yet. So I'm happy to continue to have conversations. And if I have anything in here where you just think I'm totally wrong, please absolutely pull me aside and tell me, because I'm hoping to get better at this. Uh, sustaining engineering, uh, not something I, I invented. Uh, that's something I came into um, fairly late. I first heard about it from Microsoft 10, 15 years ago, maybe. Uh, and also, the defense industry has used it for how they uh, maintain planes. For example, you get a plane from Lockheed or whatever, now it sits in your hangar, and the people that keep it running are, are sustaining engineers. I didn't bother to source any claims, so big grain of salt. Uh, don't necessarily trust me on that one. So let's, let's talk about staffing. Uh, I think staffing is incredibly important and not something that we do uh, well enough as an industry. So any, anytime I want to talk about here's what a group of people are doing, I want to talk about the staffing for that group of people. Uh, when I see sustaining engineering, I see primarily two different groups of people as uh, the type of people that I want to staff uh, onto our Purple Cross team. The first are our junior engineers. Uh, th these are people that are going to need exposure to a lot of different things, maybe don't know yet uh, where, their, uh, where their deep knowledge is, is going to be, don't really know yet what, what drives them, but they want exposure to a lot of different things. So as a junior engineer, sustaining engineering is, is a great way to do something different every day. You're going to deal with the load balancer problem now, and then you're going to deal with this weird thing that you got to debug in the Linux kernel, and then you're going to deal with something else uh, the, the next day. And you're not just going to be sitting worrying about, OK, I'm going to code my thing in JavaScript, and then I'm going to recode my thing in JavaScript, and then I'm going to refactor my thing in JavaScript. So junior engineers who need a lot of exposure to different things and want that exposure, this is a great place for them. And I also think this is a great place for your, uh, your senior experienced engineers, the people that are comfortable in a fast-paced environment. You're, your hardened badasses like Carol who've seen some shit and know how to deal with it. You, you want these people on your team to be able to uh, uh, handle the, the stuff when no one knows how this works, but it's on fire and you need to fix it. OK, great. Those people come in and they're, they're able to handle it. Um, I, I refer to these as, as Brownfields SREs, uh, but that's, that's the type of uh, skill set that, that you're looking for, for for this type of people. Now, I've identified junior engineers uh, and your, your, your experienced engineers. These are who, who are going to staff your, your Purple Cross team. Um, so before this talk, um, uh, who has heard of sustaining engineering? Um, is this a concept people have? OK, not, not many. For the people that, that have, has the thing you've heard about it, we fix bugs? Is that, 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 that's usually what I get. Oh, yeah, sustaining engineering, you guys fix bugs. Yes, that, that's true. Uh, we, we fix bugs. But what's more important than the bug fixing is the, the long-term architectural changes. Um, uh, I actually I must have deleted a slide. Uh, let's go back to, to, to staffing. I wanted to, uh, to raise a point about the junior engineers and the experienced engineers. There's, there's a gap in between. I'm not necessarily going to grow my junior engineers into these senior experienced engineers on the same team. There's, uh, there's pretty much a gap in the middle where you've got some skill and you, uh, you, you kind of know what it is you, you want to work on, but you're maybe not yet at the level of that, uh, that experience, Carol. And you may rotate off the team and go to something else, and that's perfectly fine. I think that's a valid staffing plan for the, for the Purple Cross team, and, and I wanted to call it out that um, that is baked into the, into the assumption. Sorry about that. Uh, so back to long-term architectural changes. There are things that go wrong with stuff that just lives on in production and has not been touched. You have not written any new code for any of this stuff. And at some point, a database column is going to overflow, and you're going to have a serious problem. Or you're going to have issues with, uh, with inst instant types where you're going to need to upgrade to the, the newest instance type so you can get the, the cost savings and the, the performance increases. And that's architectural work that needs to be done by someone. 
Um, there's also backup strategies need to change. Uh, the backup strategy that you use for uh, a product that, that you're building uh, and maybe is gonna break more often and a product that is kind of sitting on the shelf unchanged for a while, you're gonna need to, to rebalance some of those things. So uh, there are some, some definite things that happen in software products that are long lived that aren't necessarily bugs or poor decisions that were introduced at any given time that, that need to be addressed. And th these are the types of things that you need people who are, who are truly engineers to, to be able to understand, manage, handle, and uh, fix, make better down, down the road. One of my favorite was, uh, was uh, time creep. Uh, we had a system, no one had touched it for, for a long period of time, but that system was a deployment system. And over the course of months, the deployments went from 15 minutes to an hour 15 minutes, an hour 20 minutes, and for deployment, that's really bad. No one had touched the code, but things that just happened in the system that needed, to, uh, that needed some architectural changes. Um, so that was a fun one. And at some point, you're also going to need to uh, retire and deprecate some of your services. You're going to build replacements. Someone else is going to build replacements. You're going to say, this only has two users left. It's not worth the time that, that we're, we're putting into it. So we're going to need to find out what those use cases are, see if we can shift them onto a similar product, and retire those things so you're not dealing with this cruft of 83 individual services that are, um, you know, that only have one or two users each. It's just, it's not good for, for business. So your Purple Cross team, persistent team, junior inexperienced engineers, and their focus is on doing those, that firefighting and that, that bug fixing, but also your long-term architectural health. So there's this analogy that, that I like to use. Uh, wet basements happen, they, they, they happen by course. There, there's things that you can do to, to prevent them, but oftentimes a storm will roll in, you'll end up with water in the basement, and you can bring a bunch of friends over, give them all buckets, and you can say, all right, let's, let's bail, bail water out of the basement. Uh, and this is, that's the approach that I see for a lot of, of old products. No one knows why there's water in the basement. We just, we're gonna move people over, everyone grab a bucket, clear the water out of the basement, bail, bail water, and once, once the water's gone, they send those people back off elsewhere. And that's, that's great, you've gotten water out of the basement, but you need some actual engineers that are gonna sit down and look at the problem and, and figure out, let's install some pumps, let's, let's install some drains, Let, let's figure out how did the water get in there so we don't have to deal with this again. Let's look at where it's coming in outside the, the service, water's gonna come into the house. Um, there's, there's room for, for actual engineering work to be done and just saying, okay, you people that work on a different product, you're gonna swarm in, fix this thing, and then swarm back out isn't gonna, gonna solve your stuff in the long term. So, sustaining engineering. So, once you have this concept of, we're gonna do sustaining engineering, we're gonna, we're gonna try this out as a, uh, as a company, um, once you start to think that way, here's some things that, um, that come out of that that, that are worthwhile, and uh, let's, let's take a look. So, first thing, transitioning a service, once you've got that purple cross team and you want to give them stuff, this, this isn't a notification. Oh, hey, by the way, purple cross, you guys now own blah, thank you very much. Um, that it's, it's still a collaborative effort. This is still a DevOps uh, way of working. There's, there's still gonna be um, people need to, to work with people and uh, you need to figure out how is this gonna work, how, how do we how do we get it to the, to the right people, get it in the right state? Um, so this, this is not the kind of thing where it's just another silo, you throw it over the wall and it's done. Uh, it's also not, importantly, a second swing at the backlog. So th this is not the case where you say, oh, we've got a sustaining engineering team who's gonna own this, so we're not gonna address any of that technical debt. They'll deal with it, right? That, that's, not, that's not the purpose of this. The purpose of this is for the, the long-term architectural stuff and the and the unknown unknowns that someone needs to handle down the road. So you're not just gonna hand, hand a team of junior engineers this thing and say, all right, fix all those bugs in the backlog that, that we already know are there. That's, that's not what this is about. Some things that it might be, you may need to talk about what does this thing actually do for you? It, what's the importance of, of, this, of this service? If, if I don't know who your customers are and what it is they're looking to, to get out of it. I might make changes that 
aren't really uh, aligning with the, the original purpose of it. If I don't know what those user stories are that it was built on, I, I might do something that is going to completely change it, like, uh, l l like we heard with the old ladies in the green screens. I'm going to introduce a change that sounds great, but it's not going to fulfill the needs of the, of the user. So um, it may also be a, a tough conversation. There's some stuff where the business says, yeah, we've got this thing running on this box. It's just plugged into a wall, and now you guys need to own this because no one else knows anything about it. And that's happened. Uh, that, was, uh, that was a fun one as well. Um, and sometimes, in that case, you inherit the code, and you have to rebuild architecture in a sustainable way, uh, and, and you go on. Uh, so sometimes they're tough conversations, um, but they, they're always uh, important conversations that have to focus on what is the end result we're looking for, uh, just saying, sustain this code as a matter of sustaining this code isn't going to work out. You're not going to get the results that, that you need. So the services that you're going to want to look at to actually transition, uh, I've got a couple useful metaphors here. Don't stretch them too tight because they'll, they'll break. But uh, lighthouses, if you think about a service that is absolutely vital, this thing needs to run every night but it doesn't break very often, and when it breaks, like there's not a lot of moving parts. You kind of know, hey, the bulb is on or the bulb is off. It, it's, it's a fairly simple uh, service that needs to work all the time and is typically rock solid. Great, those things are perfect to, to transition. You get good documentation, you get people trained up on like, what does it mean to, to run a lighthouse, and go. And then your sustaining engineering team can have dozens of lighthouses because they're all kind of similar uh, and they all need to work and they all will work for the most part and you can get a rapid response when you need it. Uh, my favorite kind of service are, are the dogs. These things are not necessarily business critical, but they're fun to have around. They make employees happy, they make users happy. They're, they're, they're not necessarily the, the kind of thing where if, if they weren't there, the business wouldn't operate, but there's generally a user base for these things that uh, are, are good to, to have around. Um, and these things are also going to need daily maintenance. They're going to need some care and feeding. They're going to need some, some attention. It's not the kind of thing you can ignore. Uh, but because of the, the joy that they bring to your, to your users, uh, they're, they're the kind of things that are, are fine. OK, great. These, these can go to sustaining engineering uh, while, while the engineers that built them can go off and do other things. Now, the difference between a dog and a puppy, you, you can hand me a dog and say, yep, good to go. He's all set. You, you cannot come to me and be like, yeah, we think we'll have uh, housebreaking in in the next patch or three, and uh, you know, uh, doesn't have a shots yet. We, we made an appointment for the vet. It'll, it'll get spayed in a little bit, but here you go. It's yours. Like That's not ready for it yet. Let's wait for that thing to mature into a dog, make sure that the user base is there, and make sure that there's some stability before you just say, I built this thing over a week, and it's really cool. I like it. Here you go, and, and run. Um, so hand me plenty of dogs, but not puppies. And the reason that dogs are fine is because they scale. Uh, if, if I have one thing that I need to do some daily maintenance on, some, some more regular stuff on, I, I'm going to need to go in and make sure it's, uh, it's not going to have storage issues. I'm going to need to make sure that uh, uh, th there's some regular checks that are done, some, some regular um, uh, service reboots or, or whatever. Anything that needs to happen here is easily scripted and it scales. Uh, if you're already going to take the time to build in the plumbing to handle one dog, you can then scale that out to three dogs, five dogs, a dozen dogs, and it, it's very little um, uh, more engineering. Well, once you already have everything you need for that first dog, you, you can apply it to a bunch of other services that, that need that kind of daily care and maintenance. So, your, your long-running stable systems that you don't need to touch very often, um, great. Your, your systems that, that you need to touch all the time, perfect, because I can scale those out uh, really well and really cheaply. So once your Purple Cross team is in place and they've got their set of services, uh, we've got our staffing in place, uh, and we are properly transitioning things into that team, you can build a culture for sustaining. People can, can realize that. You can, you can get things to a place where they, they are stable and they can be tra transitioned over and you're not having these horrible conversations where this thing broke, we don't know what to do about it. Do we, do we have to page someone in the middle of the night who's transitioned to, to another team? You, you have an understanding of how the business wants to work with, uh, with services that, that, um, that exist and how you want to move on. 
Um, one place that's key is the documentation. Once you start writing documentation for use by people that did not build the service, you're gonna start to, to do it slightly differently. Uh, it's not gonna be the kind of thing where I just need to go down to the thing where I know where I wrote the thing and I've got the information. You're gonna need to, to write document, documentation in a way for someone who doesn't know the guts can figure it out really quickly. And one of the biggest points that, that I can make on this is code as documentation doesn't work for this. I can tell by looking at your code what it does. I cannot figure out why it does. Uh, if, if I have some, something in there that looks like a bug and I go to fix that bug, but I change it in a way that it no longer suits the, need, the needs of the business because it wasn't clearly explained, we're doing this in a certain way because blah, then I've changed your, your user stories without knowing it. So documentation needs to be in place to tell me why things are the way that they are. Um, so please don't do that, that code as documentation thing. Um, one, one way that you can kind of skirt this with, really great tests. If you've got all of your, your use cases that really hit all of your business needs, I can kind of see from those the why of everything, but it, it's really great to have documentation, and it's kind of the least you can do if you're gonna write something and hand it to someone else. Give them an instruction manual. The third thing that you start to see when you have uh, a, a culture of building something and handing it to kind of a more centralized team, you start to standardize on a set of defaults. You're not setting a top-down governance, but what you are doing is, is you're saying, okay, the sustaining engineering team, the Purple Cross team, they, they like using Sumo Logic for all their logging. I don't really care where I send my logging, I just need a logging endpoint. So I'm just gonna build Sumo into, into my stuff and then I don't spend the time as an engineer trying to figure out which is the right place for me. I just know I need to put my log somewhere. It's gonna to go to the endpoint that I know these folks are gonna need. Uh, and there are a bunch of other decisions that um, as, as an engineer, if you're autonomous and building something from scratch, you're gonna to need to make decisions about platforms and the different kind of things that you're gonna to need to put in. If there's no real advantage to one thing over, over another, you can just start to gravitate towards what is Purple Cross going to use? What are they familiar with? What are they comfortable with? Uh, and you're going to have a, a series of defaults. Uh, having that familiarity for the Purple Cross team is also more scalable because it means that every time you build a service in a language that no one on Purple Cross knows, I then have to do expensive retraining or I've got to hire another person who can, who can sustain that. Uh, I'm all about being polyglot. That's fine if that's the right language for it. Um, but if, you, if you're just going to be like, I could write it in this or this because these, these are both good tools for the job, but your Purple Cross team is gonna be familiar with one and, and not the other, then that's, that's your decision right there. Uh, if it's gonna be arbitrary for the engineer, but it's not gonna be arbitrary for the business in the long term, then that, that helps. So if you can think of having your Purple Cross team who have a set of understandings, a, a set of, uh, tools that they're familiar with and they have some people on the, on the team that are really rock solid and they understand the nuances of those things, then here's another group of people that you would like to shift left. Um, uh, oftentimes in DevOps we talk about a lot of people that you wanna move left as, as stakeholders and I've just created another one for you and I'm sorry, but any, anyone that you kinda wanna get involved in your value stream as a business, getting them involved early in the process is, is gonna be better for you. So if you can merge the sustaining considerations left, then that'll be best for everyone. Uh, gonna skip over the Q&A and I'll talk to you about what I still don't know. Um, so if you're gonna take a picture, this is the one, the main takeaways here, there's gonna be sustaining engineering for any software that you build. It's either gonna be done by the people that originally built it or it could be done by a centralized team. And involving that centralized team as a stakeholder earlier is gonna enable you to, to get those defaults set up. It's gonna enable you to, to make those, those kind of decisions. And your Brownfields SREs are, are gonna be able to even provide your, your junior engineers that are just in your traditional development org with some, some good advice. Um, if if your, your junior engineer is going to build a new thing and they say, 
yeah, I just got to set up this thing in AWS. I don't really know how, how, the, how the networking works. Your Brownfields SRE can be like, oh, yeah, how about you take a look at the, some of the stuff that we already build and sustain, and uh, that'll help out. So the stuff that I don't know that I'm still trying to figure out, what the organization looks like. Uh, we originally started off as kind of distributed embedded engineers, then we formed a guild. The guild wasn't really working, so we formed a centralized team, and now we've kind of split that centralized team into a component framework model where we have 13 engineers who have uh, assembled themselves into 49 sub-teams, and that seems to be working pretty well. That doesn't feel scalable, but uh, that, that seems to be the best solution we've come up with so far. How early is too early to get the Purple Cross involved? Uh, at what point, you know, I say move them left. How far left? I don't, I don't really know. Uh, I've had some, some cases where being involved as like a Brownfields SRE with people that are still building a product, uh, I've gotten a bit too early in the process and uh, hasn't provided a, a ton of value. Um, and how involved is, is too involved? I've, I've done that where I'm basically providing monitoring as a service because, yeah, I'm gonna use Sumo and New Relic and I have all these endpoints set up for you and then I'm just basically doing the work for you instead of the people building the service, which isn't necessarily bad, that, that's good for the business as well, but that's kind of the job of like a Greenfields SRE as well, so still trying to figure out where the lines are and where the boundaries are to, to make it uh, the, the best role for, for the company. And the last thing I don't know, uh, if you're in the type of organization who uh, cares about chargebacks, uh, this is important. Who, who is my customer? If I am sustaining these 49 services, uh, are the end users still going to the, the people or the product owners that built those services and I'm now a subcontractor of theirs? Or does there need to be some transition where those end users now, now need to be told, okay, please don't keep emailing me about this. You need to go email the Purple Cross because they're the ones that handle this from here on out. And we've kind of done a half and half approach at Vistaprint where sometimes we, we just get escalated to uh, and sometimes we have to kind of retrain the, the user base. Okay, for this thing, now, now come here. Um, so trying to figure out who your customer is and who, who gets to, to figure out um, what that escalation path looks like and retraining the end users can, can be a bit tricky. So uh, those are things I don't yet know uh, and I'm still working on figuring it out. Thank you very much for uh, sitting through all, all this. If you want to talk about it more, I'll put up a sticky for, uh, for an open space and I'm happy to hear about if any of this stuff up here is just flat out wrong. Thank you so much.